Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to have each of you here this morning, and those back from Dallas, and make a great morning to study the Word of God once again. We'll be in Acts chapter 8 this morning in our continuation of the study of the book of Acts. We finished up the stoning of Stephen last week in Acts chapter 7. Again, the uh, the best one chapter summary of the history of, of the Jews, starting from Abraham right on through, is Acts chapter 7. Can you redo that one? Can we redo that. So, to repeat what I said last week. Uh, so we're going to pick it up in Acts 8. The answer is yes, I can, but just not this morning. Okay, so Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Remember, let's go back to uh, uh, verse 58 of Acts chapter 7. It says, And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. So now, 8-1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Okay, he's a ringleader again. And we're going to start beginning... We're going to start... We're going to begin to be introduced starting the introduction of, of this guy Saul. And of course, as we know today, since we have already seen the end of this game film called the Bible, uh, we know that this guy Saul later will become Paul, later will write 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. He's going to tell us like 17 times he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And so we know where this is going. But of course, put yourself in this time frame, the stoning of Stephen... This is really where the nation of Israel falls, or begins their fall. Because the first thing when Saul does get going, or when he becomes Paul and starts his ministry, he's going to go to the Jew first. Okay, So not until the end of Acts 28 do the Jews become, well, am I not my people? But this is really the fall of the nation of Israel. Um, then it becomes individual Jews from this point forward. So anyway... So Saul was consenting unto his death, verse 1. The other thing that's key about that is, that means Paul was guilty of what sin besides murder? I'll give you murder first. Besides murder, blasphemy, exactly. And why was that important at that time? Unforgivable sin. Unforgivable. Matthew chapter, 9, uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. For those of you that have neat note Bibles, you can put Matthew chapter 12. I'm, I'm smiling for the camera here. Um, uh, one gentleman back here just got a great gift uh, from his parents. And every other page is a full blank page to take good notes. Um, wow. Yeah. Hey, here you go. Because I don't use this during, well, I'm teaching if you want to. And it's, it's good because it doesn't bleed through. I think you can get those at Walmart even. That's, it really is a real good one. Fine print. Uh, yeah, for that's what I was just thinking. That's a fine. It's a, that, that's it's not a fine. Fine. That's not for fifty-year-olds. Okay. <laughs> so blasphemy. Uh, Matthew chapter twelve, verse thirty-one tells us, and you don't need to turn back here. I'm not going to turn today, but it just says, um, "But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven you, neither in this world." neither in the world to come. It was the unpardonable sin. Something had to change. So Paul would have been doomed for hell, if you will, had something not changed, which it will later on. The message, it'll be revealed later on. It changed at the cross. All right, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So you know which church we're talking about. It's called the church which was at Jerusalem that Peter and the twelve started. And they were all scattered abroad throughout, uh, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the apostles stayed in Jerusalem at this time. But notice that phrase, they were all scattered abroad. Okay, come over to Acts chapter 11. That's a key, key phrase, really. Acts chapter 11... Acts 11 and verse 19. And it says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen 
traveled as far as Venus and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Okay, so they're scattered abroad again there in 1119. Now, why are you making a big deal about it? Because there's one other time in your Bible that this phrase, scattered abroad, is used. Remember context, when you study your Bible. Who's writing it? To whom are they writing? What comes before, what comes after? To whom are they writing? Again, keep your hand in Acts 8, that is our study today. But now go to James chapter 1. So we've just seen twice that the Jews were scattered abroad when Stephen was stoned. They were afraid for their lives. They scattered abroad. Hebrews, then James. James chapter 1. You get to Peter, you've gone too far. Now let's watch this book of James. Right in verse 1, he's going to tell us who he's writing to. James 1.1. He says, James, that's who wrote it, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. My brother, and count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. And on and on he goes, okay? But we see right there in verse 1 who, or to whom, James is written. The twelve tribes scattered abroad. Okay, so you can't miss that. So when people try to, there are many people that will try to put you into James. It's all about works. Well, it's not to us. It's to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Okay, so and this also gives you a good uh, time frame uh, as to when the book of James was written. Okay, somewhere around Acts eight to Acts eleven, somewhere in there, right where we just read, they were all scattered abroad. They they fled. They were afraid for their lives. Okay, back to uh, Acts eight now. Okay, the end of uh, uh, verse one again. Except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, whoa, here's this guy Saul again. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Well, how do you do that? Entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Okay, so there, there we are. There's... Have we seen enough about scattered abroad being referenced to this time period? The church here, the church which is at Jerusalem, scattering. They're afraid for their lives. They're running for the hills, if you will. Now, this guy Saul. I want to take a minute and talk about when it says he made havoc, in verse 3, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women. Let's take a look at exactly... You know what Saul is doing. Come to Acts chapter nine, which we'll go in you know next week. But Acts nine, verse one, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Okay, so. Just tells us a little bit more about what he's doing. But whose permission did he did he obtain? The high priest. The high priest, exactly. Well, let's look at how he when he talks about this later on, towards the end of his ministry, he's going to refer back. So come to chapter twenty two. In both chapter twenty two and twenty six, Paul's giving an accounting of his salvation, really. Acts chapter twenty two. In verse 4, and Paul, referring back to that time, says, And I persecuted this way unto the death. Unto the death, gang, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom, pardon me, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. Okay? He's, he's gone. He's throwing them into prison. 
And he had many of them committed to death. As he said in verse 1, I persecuted this way unto the death. Okay, come over to uh, 26 when he also refers to this. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verse 10. Which thing also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. He witnessed in a court of law. He was one of the guys that testified against the, the church at Jerusalem. Anybody he had captured, if you will, threw into prison... He's one, one of the people that testify and have him put to death. Uh, so the end of verse 10 again, And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them off in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. I mean, Paul was getting on with it. He was the ringleader of the persecution against the church that Peter and the Twelve started. Okay, You can't miss it. And yet, as we're going to see, again, we know how this film ends, if you will, how this game ends. That's the guy that's going to bring a new message to people like you and me in this room. That's who God Almighty used. At that time, did Paul realize he was a blasphemer himself? At that time, no. Paul thought he was doing right in the eyes of God Almighty. He was doing this for the Lord, if you will. Think of all the holy wars that have happened over the years. Right? Paul, that's why he went to the chief of the high priest to get the letter from him. Paul thought he was serving, if you will, God Almighty by getting rid of this black. He thought the blasphemy was Peter and the Twelve. Great question. It would, it would have been actually under the old covenant. Under the old covenant it was. If they didn't see the transition, the change in doctrine that occurred when Peter stood up in Acts chapter 2 for the first time and brought a new doctrine to the people, if they missed it, they were committing blasphemy. Paul missed it. He was committing blasphemy. But he thought it was so blasphemous, as did so many of the Jews, that he actually went to the high priest, hey, hey, let me go get rid of them. Let me go throw them into jail. We'll put them to death. Paul was getting on with it. He was serving God Almighty the way he thought. The way he thought. Does that go on today? We're here on a Sunday morning. How much is going on across the country today? People doing what they think instead of what God Almighty says is the way to serve Him. Okay, so great question. Paul thought he was doing right in the eyes of God. Okay? Now, back to Acts chapter 8. That's a key thing to see. Okay, so we get the picture. Everybody's scattering abroad. They fear for their lives because this guy Saul is coming and, and wreaking havoc, as it says, on the church. Okay, verse 5. Now we're going to change and go to another story. But just remember, that's what's going on at that time. Next week we'll come back to it when we get to 9, assuming we finish 8 today. Alright, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. It's Philip. And he's one of... Uh, so remember back in, in Acts 6, when they picked... Uh, Seven men, verse 3, Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they picked seven men full of the Holy Ghost. Philip is one of those seven men. So he's not one of the twelve, but he is one of those seven. Alright, now back to 8. Chapter 8, verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Samaria. What are Who are Samaritans? What are Samaritans? They're Jews. Half. Half-breed. They're, they're, they're a bunch of half-breeds. Okay? Half. They're Jew and Gentiles. Oh, they're half-breeds. So they took wives of the other... Yes. So you're saying they're Gentiles following the way of the Jews? No. They, the like their parents, literally, are, you know, one parent's a Jew, the other parent's a Gentile, and Which, they literally... And so they are following the ways... They're in the synagogues, so, they, so the, any of them... 
they're, they're acting like Jews, just that they're not by birth 100% Jew. They're so, half-breeds. So they could be like a Philistine. Yeah, part, they're, part I mean, Philistine. literally, one parent is Jew, the other parent, Gentile. They're half-breeds. They're not full... Yeah, like Timothy. Thank you, that's, that's a good example. Timothy's father was a Gentile, his mother was a Jew. Okay? So, so that's who they are. Uh, verse uh, 6 now, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. And watch this next phrase. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Who requires signs? Jews. Jews. So these people are acting like Jews, absolutely. Just that they're not full by blood. But they needed to see the miracles. And therefore, Philip had the gift <coughs> of miracles. Uh, and, and they're going to explain it now in verse 7. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. Okay, you see the gifts explained right there that Philip has, just like Peter and the Twelve did back there, right? And there was great joy in that city in verse 8, verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. And why wouldn't they think he was a great one, right? If he could do these things, he's a sorcerer. To whom they all gave heed, from the last to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. The Jews require a sign. They see signs, they think the man is of God. What's going to happen in the great tribulation? Mm. That and The man of perdition, the Antichrist, is going to stand up and he's going to work signs and wonders and they're all going to say, Ah, there's the second coming of Christ. He's back on earth. No, he's the Antichrist. But that's why they'll think that's who it is. Because he works the signs and wonders. For that matter, he's actually going to die in the middle of the trip, right at the three and a half year period. This man dies... And guess what? Three days later is when he's resurrected from the dead. Does that sound like another story in your Bible? Yeah. Satan is the great counterfeiter. <clears throat> Virtually everything that God the Father does, Satan counterfeits. Throughout. Go right back to Abraham. Isaac, Ishmael. And so it begins. And so it continues to this day. All the time. If you don't believe that, just watch the news every morning and every evening. Or don't. Or don't, yes. You don't need to. Take our word for it, right? But that's exactly what's going on. It was, if you will, prophesied clear back in the book of Genesis, chapter 20, 22, somewhere in there, that this guy Ishmael and his seed after him would be a, it calls him a wild man, and he'd be at enmity against the seed of Abraham. Okay. Anyway, back to um, our study here. So this is great power of God. The Jews saw it, and that's what they said at the end of verse 10. This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Whoa. Be careful what you fall for. Ah, come on, we're just going to go to this palm reader one time and just for the heck of it. Uh, have you done that? No. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, before, before, like when you were younger. When no. You were, okay. I'm surprised. That's one of the one things I can probably say I didn't, Jerry. So <laughs> I was into other things. They, yeah. They go once a week. The worst thing. They check it out. <laughs> um, it, anyway. So we bewitch them with sorceries, but you know, hey, let's face it, there are evil spirits, and that in in continues to this day. Remember, how many of the angels followed Satan out of heaven? Third. A third. That's a lot. And, and look you at, know, look at how many different Bibles there are. Yeah, exactly. Just check that many, out. So for the film, look how many different Bibles there are. Exactly. Uh, you know, there, there's a story back there in Mark where that man with the unclean spirits and the Lord Jesus Christ comes up to him and he casts the spirits into the swine. Yeah. You ever, and the swine do what? They run into the sea, right? Right. 
jump off the cliff. They jump off the cliff. They drown themselves. You remember how many swine there were? Two thousand. Two thousand. That's a lot of spirits in that guy to go into. Two thousand. Matter of excuse me. Six thousand. I don't remember. I don't remember. Legion. He, oh, you know what? Let's go back to, to Mark. <coughs> Give me a second here. I want to say nine. Um, Two thousand. Mark five. Mark, Mark five. Thank you. Thirteen. All right. Glad to see some. I was just seeing how well you all been studying your Bible. Uh, so Mark chapter five, verse thirteen. In parentheses, there were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. Okay, so. Just think about that. That's a lot of swine, or a lot of spirits in that man to go into 2,000 swine to make them run into the sea and drown themselves. Now, does that still happen today? No, not today. So uh, people aren't... Are, well, so does that still happen today? What's the that? Yeah. Uh, spirits in people. Can, can people be possessed? Yes, they can be. Can a saved person be possessed? No, they cannot be. So uh, but is it the same way that it was back here? I don't believe so. <clears throat> so you say, so if people are possessed now, it's just by one, as opposed to 2,000? Oh, that I don't know, and I don't know that even back here it was always 2,000. I would think, you know, this is the only time where it's ever close to being quantified as to how many. But uh, because actually further back in that same passage... Verse 9, so, so Mark chapter 5, verse 9. He says, come, Verse 8, he says, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit, singular. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Legion. That's thousands in the, in the Roman army. A legion? Okay, that would be thousands. Six thousand is a legion, exactly. Uh, so verse 10, and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country, and on and on. So anyway, and then 2,000 uh, swine go in. So there could have been 6,000 spirits in him. He said, uh, my name is Legion, for we are many. So when this happened, we like, when, and if like, I don't know if this happens now, but if a priest does an exorcism, <laughs> is it the same? No. And it... No, because right there... Uh, the word priest. And is it true? Okay, you're going to have priest. to edit this film, right? So so right there, what you just said. So if a priest, I'm going to assume you mean a Catholic priest. Okay, so we got to start with, is the man saved or not? If that Catholic priest is following the doctrine of the Catholic Church, I'm going to say, no, he's not saved. He's could saved. he be saved? Yes, he could be, if he followed the Gospel of Christ <laughs> that the Apostle Paul lays out in your Bible. But if he's following the doctrine of the Catholic Church, which I would say is probably a pretty good guesstimate that that's what he's doing, he's not a saved man. No, he would not have the power to do this. So you're saying a saved man would have a power? I'm not, power no, I'm not saying that. a saved man would have the power to do it. I'm saying a Catholic priest following the doctrine of the Catholic Church would not have the power to do it. That's what I'm saying. So then it's not true that that could be that can happen it's now. Hoax. That people can, even a Born saved person can't spirits. do an exorcism. Nowhere in Paul's writings do we see any of that um, well, as, good as a gift, or as yes, it, it goes back to the Jews. Um, if so, anyway, nowhere do we see Paul doing that. So I don't see a reason where that would be a a gift for a man to have today. So if a person is possessed by a spirit and then becomes saved. Spirits out. Okay. There you go. What I, I have a I have a thought pattern on when this whole thing is not so much of the human, um, but now you have the animal, so they're able to pass from the human into an animal. So now, how long can they survive in an animal? And 
Hey, what? I, I think we're starting to go into some areas that really aren't Paul's doctrine. Probably four, so, please. if I may, let me come right back to Acts eight, and, and maybe during the break we can I'm pick that back up. No, no, that's fine. Uh, Has your animal been active? Okay, so <laughs> she probably never not has been has. <laughs> so we're on we're on verse twelve of Acts chapter eight, verse twelve. So they had regard of this man, Simon, because a long time he bewitched them with sorceries. Verse 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And I believe this is the first time we have the separate or the, the inclusion of both men and women. I mean, being specified like that. Both men and women. Verse 13, then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Okay, remember, Philip is doing these miracles, these signs. Now watch verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem, the twelve, okay? When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Because remember, we read earlier, the twelve were stayed in Jerusalem, right? So they're going to send Peter and John down there. Isn't that interesting? Kind of, It's like Peter and John are always the two that get sent. Okay, if you remember back in Acts uh, 3 and 4, it was Peter and John that went so, as a team. But watch what happens now. <laughs> so end of 14, they send unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, if he's, if they are praying for them to receive the Holy Ghost, do they have it yet? No, but they were believers, right? They were baptized like they were supposed to back then. And they are seeing the miracles and the wonders going on, but they do not yet have the Holy Ghost. They being... All the Samaritans that were there... Listening to Philip preach, thank you. Always quantify, you know, to whom are we talking about, right? Great question. Always get that whenever you're studying your Bible. Who is it that we're talking about? Who's them? Great question. So we pray for them, the Samaritans, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 16, parentheses even. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. End of parentheses. Wow, so in case we missed it, they put it right there for us. Now, verse 7, Luke put it right there for us. 17, then, so after that, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, the point I want to make here is, did Philip, who was one of the seven, I'll call them secondary apostles, and that's my term, okay, I'm making a point, not a biblical term, but they were the seven men full of the Holy Ghost in Acts 6, right? Stephen being one, Philip was the second one mentioned. But they could not, if you will, give the Holy Ghost. It took Peter and John to come down for those people to receive the Holy Ghost. Question. But Philip was performing miracles. He was performing wonders and signs and miracles, absolutely. So he that he could do. So he had the Holy Ghost? He had the Holy Ghost, yes. Because he was one of the seven. <coughs> yeah, let's go back. So, good question. Did he have the Holy Ghost? <coughs> Philip did have it. Back there in verse 6. Chapter verse, six. Cha Thank you. Chapter 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look out ye among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. Got it. Okay. okay. They had it, and they, they had received it back there in Acts chapter 4, in verse 30. <coughs> 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the Word of God with boldness. That was the first time right there that anybody other than the twelve received the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And Philip and Stephen would have been there at that time. Mm, okay. There were like 8,000 people there at that time as part of the church. Okay? Good questions. you, you got to have Scripture proven Scripture. Absolutely. Okay, now we're back to Acts 8. So in verse 17, it took Peter and John. It says, Then laid they, Peter and John, their hands on them, the Samaritans, and the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost. 
And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, there you go again, it was the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Remember, this guy's been a sorcerer all his life, right? Kind of likes this idea of getting this power. Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this manner, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore, change your mind, repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. That's amazing that would happen. Returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Okay? Last name, 20 and 21. Yes. I think that still happens today. Uh, and again, when you say that, well, what what's that? That still happens today. Well, not they that. think that they can purchase. Right. Yeah. No, all right. the time. Kim and I had some good friends. You know, actually, better friends of her parents. I, I can remember way back, um, and it was a big certain denomination church in Meridian, Mississippi. And he went in and bought all new pews for this church as long as they would put a nice big placket at the back that said donated by this Joe man's Bob. name. Joe Bob, we'll call him. That's a good name. And every you met a Joe Bob, he was it. But he was a gazillion there, Joe Bob. He was, uh, they call about being sly as a fox. But he thought he was buying his way. Yeah. Absolutely. He was buying his way in. And people believe that, though. All the time. That's the same guy that all the time the basket when they put money in when they were passing it. Yeah. So, good, good point. All over today. And, of course, we even have some religions that, uh, you know, it's amazing. This thing called purgatory wasn't, you know, it was a thousand years after the Catholic Church started before this thing, purgatory, entered into it. It wasn't there from the beginning. And the church was running, if you go back and read the story, the church was running low of money, and and he needed a fundraiser. Mm. And they started this fundraiser to come to, to the church and pray for those souls that have died already, and let's pray them out of purgatory. And by the way, to come in and do this, you leave your donations at the front. And that's how it started. That's how purgatory started. I mean, it's just, it's. Uh, anyway, you're really going to have to edit this tape. Or, but what well, Catholics believe is I'm that not that purgatory <laughs> was always there. Is that true? I, I would say most probably do until they're told otherwise, but you, it's easy to go back and find that. You, you know, you probably even just Google, you know, in what year was purgatory invented? Discovered whatever word you want to use, but um, it was a thousand years after the Catholic Church started. And by the way, the Catholic Church started about 200, 250 years after the crucifixion. Okay, Peter was not the first pope. The Catholic Church didn't start for another 200, 250 years. Anyway, I didn't come here to this morning to slam. I'm just, I'm just making observations that are facts that are out there. Okay. Um, but absolutely, Jerry, that goes on today all across. Um, so since I'm picking on one, I'll, uh, just to clarify, so, so the one in Mississippi there, that would have been a Baptist church, that, that individual, um, I'm not saying that's Baptist doctrine, I am saying that's what that individual was doing there, and he wanted to make sure everybody knew how much money he gave. Who gets the glory? Yeah, who, who gets, that's, that's the point, who gets the glory on that one? You know, and we'll see later on, well, okay. So, verse 23 now, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answer, verse 25. We already did that. Verse 26 is where we are. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. 
which is desert. And he, So this is Philip again. How about that? Philip gets a whole chapter. Stephen got a whole chapter, chapter 7. Philip gets most of chapter 8 here. They were the first two of those seven men in Acts 6 that were selected. We don't learn about the other five, but these two did anyway. So here's Philip. And I've always said we should all be like what Philip does here. You know, make an application of what Philip does of what we're about to read in our daily lives. Because we will come across situations like Philip does almost daily. So, let's see what that is. So verse 27, He arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the, of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Okay? He's a Jew. He needs to go. He knows that he needs to go to Jerusalem. But he's basically the treasurer of the entire country of Ethiopia. Great country back at this time. Okay? So he's a man of authority. So let's watch what happens now. Verse 28. So he had gone to Jerusalem. He was returning and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, the who? The Spirit. The same Spirit of the Lord back there, in, or angel of the Lord in verse 26. It said, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. Okay? That angel, he's the Spirit here in verse 29. He said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran. Underline that word, ran, or at least put in your mind how Philip gets on with it here. He ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he, the eunuch, said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he declared Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Uh, and in the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. This is Isaiah 53, 7. And like a lamb dumb before his shear, so open he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his, genera his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Look up. Don't keep reading, please. Alright, so you get the, the picture. Here's this eunuch. He's returning from Jerusalem. And he he's wanting to worship God, right? He's got the Bible open. He's got Isaiah. The Scriptures that they would have at that time. And he's reading it. And Philip, the, the Spirit now, says, Philip, go over there to that eunuch. And he runs to him. And he says, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the eunuch says, how can I except some man guide me? That's what I subscribe to each and every one of you. That almost daily, somebody is, maybe not literally, but at least figuratively saying to you, or, or you, you know, we can say to them, understand is thou what thou readest? They, you know, hey, I went to church today. Really? Did you, you know, understand is what thou readest? How can I except some man guide me? Hey, they are saying to you, how can I except some man guide me? That is a ministry each and every one of us can have. Matter of fact, you give me a, a way to bring something up here. So we're going to start. Now it may take a week or two, but Brian, you know, people don't know they're part of this project. Brian's already been starting these recordings and putting them on YouTube. Clayton happens to have a sister that is great with websites, and last night she ran and grabbed the domain butnow.info. So we're going to start a website, we're going to link to these YouTube recordings, and we're going to put it together in ways by subject, by date, whatever. Who knows how it's going to look? But the point is, so it's a way that you don't have you don't have to stand there and, hey, that reminds me of this verse, and, and I can go to that. You know, if you can't do that, can you at least hand them a card maybe that says butnow.info? Hey, go to this site, and, and on the front page there's going to be one to click on that says what must I do to be saved? Click on that one. Or, you know, there'll be other ones. You know, hey, you keep talking about this guy, Paul. 
Um, you know, why Paul might be another link. You know, I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but we'll have subjects like that that people can click on. I do know we'll have one that says, what must I do to be saved? So, uh, between Clayton's sister and his father, and man, they were all over it yesterday, man. They're just like, hey, wow, yeah, we could do this, and then we could do it. So it was pretty cool. Um, just kind of came out of the blue, if you will. So anyway, you. The, my point is this. Obviously, Philip, being full of the Holy Ghost, if he had enough power to do signs and wonders and miracles, you know, he, he knew the Scripture quite well, let's say, too, because he had the Holy Ghost. But... You don't have to do everything that Philip did here, but can you can you hand out a card with the website? Can you invite him to a Bible class? You know, here in Austin, we've got Sunday mornings, we've got Wednesday night in Georgetown. Who knows if there might not be others later on. Wednesday mornings in BK um, is a study that I lead uh, over there at Panera Bread. Okay, so there's different studies around the city. People can come at, at different times. Um, can we hand them a CD, a DVD? You know, like I say, Brian's putting them on YouTube right now. You, can you tell? What's the name of the uh, uh, the channel? Austin Bible Fellowship. Austin Bible Fellowship. Okay, so you can just go to YouTube and search Austin Bible Fellowship. Isn't that how that works? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> for clearing that up. Yes. Um, Where's our people under 50? Clayton, isn't that how that works? That's how that works. In the search thing? Okay, great. Anyway, you know, you can guide people. As a matter of fact, guide people. What's the word here? Uh, verse 31. And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? He didn't say, Except some man should teach me. He said, Some man should guide me. How can I except some man should guide me? You don't have to stand in front of your neighbor, your co-worker, and teach them. Can you guide them? Can you guide them to a place where they can get the information? One you could do right now is graceforall.net, Jerry Lockhart's website. There are all kinds of recordings on there. We'll have a link to that as well. But, uh, so that's one this afternoon. You don't have to wait for buttonow.info. Graceforall.net. Understanding your Bible. Understandingyourbible.com. Thank you. That's Steve Atwood, yeah, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, so there's great websites out there. And so we don't have to teach people, we just need to guide them the way Philip did. How about that? Words mean what they mean in your King James Bible. There is no wasted word in your King James Bible. If he wanted it to be teach him, it would have said, how can I accept some man teach me? No, there's a reason it says, how can I, verse 31, accept some man should guide me? And he desired, Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. You can guide people with just by handing them a card, giving them a website. It's that easy in the year 2013. Matter of fact, salvation's just as easy. You just need to help people understand. Quit trying to be good enough and just trust. Just trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that when He hung on that cross and shed His blood and died for our sins, that's why He shed His blood. He was paying the penalty for our sins. He went to hell for three days to take our place there. He died the death we deserve and paid the penalty that we deserve. Death and hellfire and damnation. He left our sins there because on the third day God the Father raised Him for our justification. The faith of Christ. He had enough faith to go through all that knowing that God the Father would raise Him on the third day for our justification as He promised. That's all we got to do is believe that and trust in that and that alone for our salvation. We're not just saved. We're sealed, Ephesians 1.13, unto the day of redemption. Nothing we can do to gain it. Nothing we can do to lose it. It is that easy. Okay, so so now, verse 35. By the way, do some of you have... Do you have NIV on yours? Right here. You're, you knew where I was going, did you? She's a mind reader. So, you have NIV, and that'll be good enough right there. Just watch how Satan... One of the tools that he's using today. We are not ignorant of his devices, okay? Paul says. 
And he calls them the wiles of the devil, the snares. This is a snare. All these other perversions of the Word of God, and you're going to see it right here. Verse 35. Actually, I'm going to ask Kim, would you read, or may I read from here so I can get it on the tape here? First, I'm going to read from NIV. And I want you, and I'm going to go verse by verse, and I want you to follow in your Bible, your King James Bible. Which so, verse? So verse 35. So again, verse 34, he said, uh, uh, is he speaking about himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same... Okay, I, actually, 36 is where I want to start. 35 is where I'll start in King James. <laughs> then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same Scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. Now, verse 36 in NIV. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in my way of my being baptized? Uh, the next verse here, it says, is 38. They don't even have a number 37. Well, 38. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Does that agree with your Bibles? Except for 37. Oh, you have a 37. I was wondering why we went right through... I want to put this to the camera. I don't know if this will show. But 36, and you can see right there, there's 36, and there's 38. There is not even the number 37. Now, somehow, the people in NIV knew that they, you know, they, they weren't just going from 36 to 37 with some, and leaving out something. They went right from 36 to 38. They knew they were deliberately and consciously leaving a verse out. Why would they do that? What do, so, for the camera, in case you're just listening, what does 37 say? So, verse 36 says, And as they went down their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Same thing, similar to the NIV so far. Here's 37 that they leave out. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 38, And He commanded the chariot to stand still, and on and on. Do you think that was a critical verse that they left out? Big time. Yeah. Big time. Huge time. Couldn't be more time. And not only that, all many of the other perversions that do include a verse 37, here's how they change it. I believe that Jesus Christ is a Son of God. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A Son of God? Are you kidding me? Oh, that's right. The Mormons believe that Lucifer and Jesus Christ are brothers. They are both sons of God. Well, have we got some messed up doctrine going on out there in the world today? God is not the author of confusion. The God of this world sure is. And that's Satan. We are not ignorant of his devices. Okay, we are. Let's, let's wrap this up here. That was just such a key. So then verse 38, He commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Enzotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Okay, and... Now Philip will be gone, if you will, from your Bibles. But uh, uh, the whole... You know, now we're going to go to Acts 9 and we're going to get into the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. Bless you. So, so the main things here... Well, I think you got the main things. I think we've been pretty adamant about going through the main things. But it's still, understand, this is still the Jewish church, this is still the church of Jerusalem that's being built, the same doctrine that Peter and the Twelve were teaching, that's exactly what Philip carried to the eunuch, and that's why water baptism was part of the program, so that he could become a priest. That's exactly what all the people being saved back there were becoming, were Jewish priests, if you will, so that they could take the word to others as well. Baptism being part of that program. Alright? So water baptism was part of the program that Peter and the twelve 
you know, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Okay, it was part of that program. But later on, it's going to no longer be part of the program. But at this point in time, up until Acts 830, 8.40, it's still part of the program. Question? Yeah, why does the, uh, the Catholic have to baptize the child when they first get baptized? Why does that have to be baptized? Well, so my first answer is you'd have to ask the Catholic doctor. So the question for the camera is why, why do Catholics have to baptize a child? It's, it's a good question. Where do you see that in scriptures? You know, you definitely see water baptism in scriptures. Yeah, People yeah. have changed the program. I believe Catholic doctrine would say that's washing away original sin. Is that correct? Original sin. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm looking to a person that went to 12 years of parochial school just to make sure I'm validating my what I'm saying. So, because I did not go to Catholic school or anything. But anyway, so they're washing away original sin. Well, as, as if you could do that. I still have Adam's blood in me, and that sin is still in me. But that that's why their doctrine says to do it. It's not, nowhere in the scripture do you see that. Even Peter in the Twelve, uh, it's not kids being, but not infants. No, but it, you, and you show that you have to yeah. receive the word first. You have to receive the word first. How's a little infant going to receive yeah. the word first? Yeah, so anyway, that, it's, it's another one that is a doctrine of men, not of God. And men are good at coming up with um, ways to get people involved in a cult. Yeah, I want to say cult in a... Well, what bondage. The, what the in, a in bondage is the word, yeah. thank you. That is the word I'm looking for. And the it Catholic, gets them into bondage. They, they have taken over Israel's spot. The Catholic Church has pretended to be Israel because... They have the priests. Right? Very much so. They have yeah, the cloaks. It, they have the temple, whatever. I mean, they have basically, yeah. they've taken the dollar. They the ran, just here. like... Most things that the Catholics do are scriptural. They're mm -hmm. just not dispensational. Yeah. It's Old Testament stuff. Go look at most, you know, so many of the things they do. It, it was things that the Jews requ were required to do back there. And, and all about the sacrifice and how they got remission of sins. You know, they went to the priest. Yeah. What what the Catholics do? They go to the priest. And it's only for those sins that you commit, you know, how long has it been since you were here? And let's give forgiveness for those sins, as if a man could do that. But that's what their doctrine says. I want to know why the priest had to start rubbing the little statue of Mary. They didn't rub it. <laughs> Whatever they do. <laughs> They hold rosary beads, yeah. which... So we'll take a break here, and at, uh, we'll, we'll go to quarter after. I got a quarter after. Yeah, she said you were acting like a... Stop. 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 Stop.